Thank you for attending the 2020 Sunstone Digital Symposium session. This is 274 titled Grief and Gratitude in Poetry, a reading of signature books, poets. The audio from this session will be available for purchase at sunstone.org after the symposium. The video recording of this session will be available in the Whova app for approximately three months beginning at the end of August, 2020. If you have questions for our participants today, or excuse me, for our presenters today, please type those questions into the Whova app that will be addressed after the presentation. At Sunstone, we're making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. Hi, um, welcome to this session, Grief and Gratitude in uh, Poetry by a reading by Signature Books Poets. Super glad that you're here. Um, we're missing a few poets this, this uh, oh, and thank you to Becky for being our moderator today. I really appreciate you um, helping us with the technical aspect and, and introducing, introducing our group as well. Um, we're missing a couple of folks. This panel originally was going to be seven poets from Signature Books, but because of uh, pandemic conditions and the challenges of virtual presentation where we are fewer but mighty, um, I'm really, really excited to be presenting today with Lisa Bickmore, uh, Susan Elizabeth Howe, and Marilyn Bushman Carlton. Um, each of these poets uh, read uh, my book, If Mother Braids a Waterfall, in its manuscript form, and each of them had a huge influence on giving me feedback and helping me shape it into a book, and I'm really grateful um, and really excited to be part of the Signature Books Press family. Uh, with with them, with these three incredible poets. So we're going to start today um, with uh, Lisa Bickmore. So give me a second to switch my screen here. Okay. So hopefully you should be seeing the PowerPoint screen. Um, okay. It looks good. Looks good. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to introduce Lisa Bickmore, our first reader. Lisa is a poet, video artist, scholar, and artist of the book, and a teacher. She grew up living all over the United States and in Japan. She is the author of three books of poems, Haste from Signature Books in 1994, Flickr, which won the 2014 Anti-Venom Prize from Elixir Press, and Ephemerist, Red Mountain Press, June 2017. Her poetry, scholarship, and video work have been published in Glass, a journal of poetry, Tar River Poetry, Sugar House Review, Southward, Cake Train, Hunger Mountain Review, Terrain.org, Bite Size Poems Project from Utah Arts Council, Quarterly West, The Moth, Mapping Salt Lake City.org, Fire in the Pasture, 21st Century Mormon Poets, and is forthcoming at Psaltery and Lyre and in the anthology Blossom as the Cliff Rose. In 2015, her poem, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this correctly, Eidolon, I'm sure that Lisa will tell us how it's actually pronounced. In 2015, her poem Eidolon was awarded the Ballymolo International Poetry Award. She earned a BA and an MA from Brigham Young University, and currently she is a professor of English at Salt Lake Community College. She teaches writing of all sorts, as well as publication studies, and is one of the founders of the Salt Lake Community College Publication Center a multifunction maker space that facilitates learning about the production and circulation of digital, print, and hybrid texts. Please, please welcome our first reader, Lisa Bickmore.
Lisa, I think you'll need to unmute yourself so we can't hear you yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no worries. There we go. Okay. Is that me? Am I, where's my video? I don't see my video. Um, hmm. I think because the, um, the slideshow's on. That we're just seeing the slideshow and not. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Well, shall we just go? Yeah, let's just okay. go. All right. So I'm, I'm reading a couple of poems from Haste, which is uh, the book that Signature published and which gave me my very first publication. And um, so I just, I'd like to start by saying how grateful I am honestly to Signature for deciding that poetry was a thing um, that they were going to publish. And I think I was one of the early books, not the very earliest, but one of them. So this poem is from Haste, What to Pray For. Once I folded hands and said the old words, so intimate except in speaking to God, a conversation that turned them into gems, hard and colorless. If now I recall the posture, it is the same motion that causes me to collect words for prayer. The word itself gathers the association of hours spent on knees, talking to bedsheets and listening for voices, hands clenched in one fist, hearing instead the speech of heartbeat, of breath in and breath out, the stroke of the slow blood swimming back to the left side. At night, I might still kneel, hear that wordless reiteration, but always I make words for the things I pray for. The empty spaces on maps, envelopes postmarked Huntsville or Fairbanks, a letter with the ptarmigan feather in it, and the story of the dull bird careening flat into the window of a friend's house. For the flat plains of the mountain mind open, oxidizing into the colors of copper and the gathering of water into rivers, the spilling of spring floods, for the opening of doors in summer, the dust accumulating, sorry, <laughs> quietly on the piano, for the ripening and rotting of apricots, a night without sleep, a morning too early, for the intelligence of the body even in decay, fingers that turn the tap in exact calibrations to water the lawn, for the thickening of breast and belly, a name for the coming child, and these words of prayer that sing all night in my veins. This was uh, right around the first time I had my first shot at a garden. And so obviously I had to write an Eve poem. In the morning of time, all the night before, my sleep was green, scented by the odor that by day I smell everywhere, as bitter and as beautiful as the light that opened me to the new world, the world to its new brilliance. I had not imagined it would be already this riot of plant, this chaos heavy with scent and seed and flower. Now I spend my days with the spike-leaved dandelion, the yellow corona exploding into a haze of seed and the twine of the morning glory, its mournful hearts for leaves, the pale ruffle of its flower. That first day I didn't see their life underground, how I'd have to seize the flat circles of leaves and twist till the ground broke and gave up the root like a fat bleached carrot or how the white morning glory root teemed without light, turning, turning, restless to open into air, leaf, flower. We were once so sure that we could name plants and animals. One would sway in wind, another leap or crawl. But now I am rooted to this field, my hands green with the weeds and everywhere, the roots lithe underground. This was for our sake, that the weeds break the earth, crumbling into this new life. Hey, Lisa. Yeah. Um, I would love to be able to see your beautiful face as you're reading these. Can we take a minute to troubleshoot? No problem. 
I hate to interrupt the presentation, but no I, mean, I love hearing you read these poems, but is there a way? Um, okay, I just, if you hover over the top uh, of the screen, is there a start, yep, video, start video? There we are. Okay. okay. All right. Reimmersing into the, into the glory. There we go. Oh, beautiful. So this next poem comes from my second book, which is Flickr, um, and it's called Litany. I dreamed I washed my hair in ash at vigil of forgotten light. The dog lay at the open door where the air spoke from the trees. Nothing, no intruder, no late child. In the music of that hour, fan ticking overhead in an unwritten rhythm, crickets surging, last or first highway cars. I dreamed I wore the white dress, my lap embroidered in fig leaves where I held the book of my beseeching. The wood smelled of stain and varnish. This is my prayer, the curtains at the window breathe a spirit caught between out and in at lauds i bathed dried my skin with a white towel dressed in the clothes i had prepared i waited in gray light hands unlaced at my belly fans crossed there lightly as if holding the ache would ease it the porch light burnt out, the street dark as if it might stay dark all day. So an Eidolon is uh, a word that means uh, both ghost and ideal. So you got the pronunciation, pr pronunciation right, Dana. Well done. The pop of the disconnect I feel as a point in space. What are the words he's just said, my son, in the language he's learning? Even the silences, so ghostly, will not be there when the dial tone finishes, after he's asked the question I could not bring myself to answer. Are you willing? Words that echo here in the American dark. I take my stick, write in the dirt in a language only I speak, which I refuse to explain. If he were here, I would show him. I collect photographs of altars, though I kneel at none. The church on the corner hides an empty nave where the icon should go. If I could unpaint it, scrape the plaster down to the bare frame, just the idea of an altar, I would worship there. But I cannot say no either willing and unwilling, neither here nor there, this nor that. At a mass for a friend's son, the priest said, a bereavement like this we never get over. I wonder, how will she ever again hold a book, thread a needle, walk or even sleep, unlearn her need for his presence, his voice occasionally on the phone, his seat at the table. I wake early or fail to sleep at all, watching for a return, but of the ordinary sun, somewhere riding his bicycle on roads that skirt a jungle, memorizing new words from cards he's made. He eats chicken and rice. The weightlessness in my empty house fails to stay me, so I leave, first to the crook of the finger on the cape, where under a brilliant sky the sea and wind spelled uproar to my ear, then to Dublin, where I stopped at every painted door, a church's red, its iron hinges with curled flourishes like an ancient script, binding of a holy book. I could have entered but didn't, though later, at the Henry's Fork, I walked on a new old road, narrow through a gate, nothing more than two posts. The hills held in their laps a shadow cast by cloud. I found a bridge where swallows kept their nests, though they were in constant flight. They traced glyphs over the glyphs of midge flight. I watched, rapt, still, 
a vigil on which nothing depended. Is this the Hajj I'm on, underwritten by nothing but what I rebuff? How strenuous my efforts not to follow the letter, how powerfully yet the form persists. It is ordinary, my son's absence, to the life I take up each day. I arise at seven in an atmosphere composed by the small fact of him gone, the uncrippling real to which I accommodate. How years of presence collapse into one shining then darkening star failing as they all inevitably do. Willing for what I should have asked him. The faculty of the will is that principle of mind by which it is capable of choosing, is what Jonathan Edwards said. And in the dailiness I prove it again and again, rise to mourn in the day with no shortage of occasion. Just before he left, the vet let us sit with the dog who was about to die. A few weeks after that, my grandmother was gone. Then the cat disappeared for a week. At the back door, I called her name into the field where mice play. I think of each loss in the same breath. I take it in, and in the instant it is taken from me. This is my calling, my pilgrimage, and after my vow of withholding, I can say, a bird loose has power and liberty to fly, but the bird's power of flying does not itself have the power and liberty to fly. To stand at that door is the faith I have in my volition. It is my will to wait, awake and dreaming, arise each day as he does, going forward wheeled creatures speaking another language at the edge of the South China Sea. I plight myself to the green life beyond, the sparrow seeking what seed has fallen in the grass, a homely scent of turnsole, all day following the sun, at night turning to be ready for light. And I'm going to read three newish poems. Um, so this is the first one. It's uh, based on the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Oh, take and seal it. It beats an urgent stranger at the door, knocking, heaves within its cage, seized, convulsed, sick with yearning, vagrant wash of gravel thrown tumbling down a slope, accident of fickle drift. It wants escape, wants its voice to open into ether. Strangers choir to me this song I once held in common with them. Now in a back row, alone, I'm broken to stay and am wild to go. Though ever have I wandered from this place, still I am here, little hum, the psalms selvage a fetter, binding curb to my bent, momentary beggar, to the searing, to tongues of flame. Dance poem. I wanted to be there, wanted to walk up the hill with friends, wanted to chant with strangers and move in loose rhythm, but I could not or did not, so hard to tell the difference when a virus blooms livid on the map and makes its way through our very breath. So I am not with you. I do not take the form of a body moving, tracing shapes in space, then just memory left of it. I can only witness it as others have, in clips of sound and movement someone else has recorded, a watcher sitting still as a bolted down chair, dances as if in shared muscle and bone. So when I watch you move on this screen, when I see you throw your arms into an arc not quite a weapon, then lay them down like an armistice, ready but unmoving, 
before a row of police, your eyes level to theirs, and lift your hands up again, your back and shoulders and thighs a mark in a fleeting cursive, signature that de declares then disperses. They are saying with their solid line, their glassed eyes, they want you to go away, but you insist you must tell somebody and I will tell somebody too. As night fell, as the lights whirled from the police cruisers, you danced not to celebrate or not only that, to say in emphatic gesture that there was a man on this corner before you, a man now gone, murdered on the street, you've made into a dwelling for confessing sorrow, for the soul's rage to say, even there at the corner where they plundered his breath with the tick and sweep of your body, of its extravagant spill into a space that would consume and abolish it, of that ruin, you've made a temple. Ode. The white horses by the lake lift their heads to see whose feet make a plodding tattoo on the road. Mine, dear white horses. I'm advancing a hypothesis that I can run, even as my years advance, adding evidence to the brief against my ineluctable decline. White horses gleaming across the damp across riparian grasses and untidy trees. Dear pearl of the sky with belled canopy and sheen, I stopped to take a photograph of the horses using the rule of thirds to frame it, more a rule of quarters to capture more sky. I love you more even than white horses in the rain, constant but not somehow insistent beating my hair and needling my shirt. Birds in transit, if these were my waters, I could name you. Still I watch you move from ground to sky, the cloudy corridors and vestibules for your traverse and watching you for once the world feels reasonable, knit of many skeins but of similar weights as you pearl the cumulonimbus drawing the sky nearer, though only when I half say it, turning an idea of the unreachable, familiar. Your gray bellies mirror the crowns of the oaks and alder, and in your unseen fingers combing the leaves, I see that you too are stirred by something invisible, the only evidence being that drift, like the little breath of cold air that seeps in around the edges of an old window. The soft inhalation of a mover, I think, for no reason except I like it, a name for that breath other than equations someone has devised to describe it. Dear space, I hold open against all evidence. The ones who have passed before me are nowhere to be seen. I hear no trace of their speech, no matter how I figure what is above me. Trees not yet a flame. Your blossom just finished. I won't be here in autumn when the cold will set color in your leaves, fire that burns but does not consume. And thus I won't hear, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes, though I am always prepared for a thing to be holy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, both for uh, going first as we <laughs> kind of troubleshoot and, and learn how to do this. Thank you. Um, and also, I didn't realize that Haste was maybe the first uh, poetry collection published by Signature. So thank you for going first in that way, too, and paving the way for the rest of us. Um, I'm delighted now to introduce you to our next reader uh, and poet, Marilyn Bushman Carlton, has three books of poetry 
on Keeping Things Small from Signature Books in 1995, Cheat Grass, Utah State Poetry Society Pearl M. Olson Publishing Award, and a Utah Arts Council Grant Award. Uh, Her Side of It from Signature Books in 2010, which was the winner of the Association of Mormon Letters Poetry Prize. A chapbook version of Her Side of It was a finalist in Comstock Review's Jesse Bryce Niles contest in 2005. Her poems have been featured in various anthologies and magazines, including Discoveries, Two Centuries of Poems by Mormon Women, Dove Song, Heavenly Mother in Mormon Poetry, and Fire in the Pasture, 21st Century Mormon Poets. And here is Marilyn. Uh Good afternoon. I am happy to be here and thank you all for being here. I am really uh, excited and privileged to be sharing this space with um, Lisa and Susan and Dana. Um, and I'm really also very appreciative of Signature Books, who, as you just heard, published two of my books. Um, and uh, I think that what I'll do today is read uh, a poem from each of my three books. I've tried to stick a little bit with the theme of grief and gratitude, although I think so many poems, um, some of them are one, either one or the other, but so many poems are both. And um, then I also am going to read from uh, a children's book that I published for my grandchildren. Uh, it's for a little older child, but um, I, I thought I would read that because it really goes with the theme. And then I will uh, read uh, some newer poems um, at the end. So this first one is On Keeping Things Small, which is the title poem of my first book. Though I know planting a terrarium has something to do with suppression, I allow myself to wallow, to delight in the sun of my power to create, build, permit life. Fear necessitates deliberate placement of each similar two-inch sprig of green, one red for variety, in this carefully planned environment. A pyramid of gravel, charcoal, treated soil, a little water. It takes work to make plants think they thrive, to make them lace and perk a consistent sprinkling to hide telltale wilting. Overachievers must be pruned, anxious leafing reduced to color spots, small enough to position, reposition if necessary. This is no place for lush plants whose large leaves cast shadows. Even now, brazen greens press against containment. This, uh, this second poem is from my uh, second book of poetry. Um, and I just need to explain that the entire book is about my grandparents. And so um, this can have a lot of different meanings, but um, it was written in uh, regard to them. Ordinary light. One hour of a particular day, like a flu, it falls upon you for the first time. You could not have known. It wasn't in the plan. You were in love, doing too much right. You knew how to please. The common skills of cooking, living anywhere he took you, making love. But after those extravagant nights on the steps, the warm bulb of the moon outweighing its stained eggshell, it happens. The one you love disappoints. You are never quite the same. The slivered scars, the errors left to fondle, and you learn how to plant a hedge of caution, to expect some sunny morning, a dread to enter unannounced, a mute to keen the bird song. You go about your jobs unsurprised when spilled garlic garbles the stew when the flame nasturtiums dim 
when the faithful cat cannot be found. As for him, from this day on, he must be satisfied to be seen in ordinary light. And this is from my second um, book by signature, The Other Women. I'm the one tagging along at my daughter's medical conference according to my badge, her guest spouse, an identification that still stings with age. When I got the chance, I chose the traditionally feminine, contemplating ordinary notions in the shelter of home, commuting to the kitchen and back. Did I settle, use my children as a crutch in case I failed? Is my hyphenated name all that came of a raised consciousness? I walk against contemporary traffic to meet Elisa after her session through crowds of gray males, the male peers, and females like her. OBGYN, their badges brag, who crowd me over with their bright bags of drug samples and babble among themselves in tongues with syllables and sentences in temperate quiet rooms, I write about my life. If it were otherwise, I would not be who I am, but I will never know what it is like to be those other women. And this one is from my children's book, Barbed Wire and Cardinals. You can't lead me down that road. Taylor Swift. Until now, there were endings, always happy or at least satisfying ones. The cruel were punished, white knights rushed in, the police came, someone was resuscitated. Since discovering Stella and the Ku Klux Klan, Louis Zamperini, Ralph Piggy and Jack on a savage island, and that the name of your elementary school recognizes a Nazi camp survivor. Your sun has tumbled from heaven, lost its halo in the fall, and turned from gold to blood. Your narrow shoulders balance a hammered mass. Thieves have stolen pebbles from the daisies, and you can't think how to put them back. But stars, Amelia, can't shine without darkness. There will always be barbed wire, but also picket fences. There are sewers and rats, yes, but cardinals come on the bleakest winter days. Intensely red, they hang their beauty out on spongy white branches. During the sunny days of late winter, they trill uncomplicated lyrics. Cheer, 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 they say, and the world turns small again and becomes possible. And these are my uh, newer poems. Judas. Everybody, well or ill, imagines a boundary of suffering beyond which she or he is certain life will no longer be worth living. At various times, I could not possibly do without long walks on the beach or rambles through, through the woods, use a cane, a brace, a wheelchair, stop teaching, give up driving, let someone else put on and take off my underwear. But one at a time, with the encouragement of others, I have taken each of these steps. When I reach the wall, I think I'll know. That's Nancy Mares from Waste High in the World. Surviving my mother by 12 years, my father became my perfect friend. Having evolved from the anxious and overly protective father I'd known as a teenager. I stopped by regularly alone, both going and coming, during monthly drives to Southern Utah, where I escaped for quiet to write. I developed a need to sit beside him. Mostly he listened as I handed him my heart, giving it wholly to him. He handled it carefully like a secret. 
he could see inside the singular heart of his second child, the one most like him, headstrong, quietly, confident. Even as I poured out questions, even disagreements, about the faith that was his life and second nature. Occasionally, about a certain grievance, he asked why I felt the way I did and listened to my explanation, nodding, yes, he could see that. He stayed deliberately on my side. His mind was sound, his body agile, his heart not only good, but strong. Then at 97, he swallowed Tums until they found the cancer. Some of my siblings and I were with him when the specialist told him what to expect, giving him a few to several months. He sat quietly while everyone cheered him on. He'd be reunited with his wife, our mother, his parents. He lived alone, stubbornly took care of himself, sometimes saying he was not ready yet. Life was still enjoyable. Very near the end, as the two of us sat close, his vision and hearing nearly gone, and the distance between us was a whisper. He confessed he wished he'd been given a choice for treatment that day in the specialist's office. I felt like Judas. Hair narratives. It's the young French father's longer arms that first reach their daughter's hair, in which her clasp is tangled. His hands lift her weeping, chaste childhood locks as he roots for the problem. Carefully, deftly, incrementally, he unknots the clasp and the hair falls free, a sonata of filaments, too many shapes to decipher. Even the dim light in the elevator we share catches the sheen, illuminates his hands as he gathers and tames it back into the blue-shaped ornament, blue O-shaped ornament. A few wispy strands stray for bottling, and my thoughts stray to Jacob. Recall his lament when Ellie was this daughter's size, how he wished for a class for fathers to learn to fix their little girl's hair. I've seen his hands delicately lift his instrument, seen them tighten the horsehair of the bow, seen him arc his fingers, lace them so the strings can sing their multifarious tones, which stir, stir and swirl lighter than the air into which they tremble, then disappear. I've seen blonde hairs escape from the clasp ends of Tip and Frog at the peak of a performance and seen his body lean and bend, stretch and dip, seen him wait for the opportune moment to rest his chin on the thin wood of his violin and with dexterous fingers quickly grasp the stray strands and pull them tidily away. At the nail salon. Is it time to let the nails go, I wonder? Why draw attention with polish, especially spring shades like lavender, a color my grandmother wore? Why display the burdens these hands have borne? Why lay bare my life, its length and habits, its mercies and sorrows, its tempests and extremities? Aware of the young technician's touch, I look into her smile, her lifted face, her attentive eyes. My nails are finished, but she is not. She embraces each used hand and needs, daubing miracles to irrigate the lines. The deep vertical caresses humble my disgrace, soothe like a lullaby. Her breath is sweet, alive, intimate, she is not frightened by the ruins of my long journey, nor of the tithes a body must pay.
this year, this star. What luck. A flash of joyous yellow peeks out from beneath the couch. Blame January for my out of proportion glee, but praise it too. For the house is again ordered and simple. Each Christ child laid into its box with holy parents and worshipers of all textures and degrees. Every year as I put the celebration away, I overlook one of the ornaments. This year, this star must have been ordained to stay. Oh, the artist who must have read my mind, how she shaped a small mean hunk of wood into this chunky butterscotch shape, then smoothed and blunted it, brushed it with gloss, making it a weight to cradle in my palm. An ersatz, an ersatz holy thing of optimism. But that's not everything. The star is meant to hang. The artist haphazardly, crudely overwrapped it with a length of rusty wire and left a generous loop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, our next reader is and poet is Susan Elizabeth Howe. Susan has published two collections of poetry with signature books, Stone Spirits, and most recently, Salt, and has published poems in The New Yorker, Poetry, Agni, Western Humanities Review, and many other journals. She has served as the editor of Exponent 2, the poetry editor of Dialogue, and of Literature and Belief, the managing editor of Denver Quarterly, and an associate editor of Tar River Poetry, and is currently an associate editor of BYU Studies. A retired BYU English professor, she lives with her husband, Cless Young, in Ephraim, Utah. Susan. I have to say thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And for what an honor it is to read with these fine poets whom I've loved all my life and who I think are just spectacular. It just gives me great joy to be in a session of poetry and to I always learn things from the poems that are read. Um, I thought of the theme gratitude and grief first in terms of elegy because when someone passes away, we celebrate their life. And in that way, we feel gratitude for them and grief at their passing. And so I wanted to start with an elegy I recently wrote um, for Wade Jacoby, who many of you may know, he was a really remarkable young professor. Um, and he just passed away earlier this year. And I've written this poem for his daughters and his wife um, called How to Get Through This. Death is unacceptable, said someone, rightly, especially when the departed was your father and a vibrant scholar, especially because he loved Springsteen almost as much as he loved your mother, especially because he gave you Europe and taught you to wear a garbage bag over your shorts and t-shirts so the cold Edinburgh rain wouldn't keep you from Hollywood, Passel or Hollywood Palace or the castle, especially because he and your mom shepherded each of you past border guards and over mountains into her own identity, her own truth, especially because he didn't miss a jump or biff a landing on that slick rock bike trip and had 30 more years to pedal until that mortal fist punched him in the heart. And now you have to not see him everywhere in the world. But doing the things he did might keep him close. Ask each presidential candidate, so what do you plan to do about death? Explain the election results to the British press or make his pet peeve yours grumble that commas are not seasoning 
to be randomly scattered over a stew of words, or sleep out with him without a tent and roll from the bag into the long grass, lying there until your sweats turn dewy and the Milky Way burns a path you can climb to the cosmos, or play American football for Germany, but not his position, quarterback, or write your own Springsteen song and sing it to your mom, or read like the most committed Republican, the most intense Democrat, then figure out how to fill in the cracks, or not fishing flies with strands of the frayed European Union, or give your own children an extra theme to write because the school curriculum appalls. Have them compare rock anthems as expressions of grief, or ask a bright student whose head is always down which professor she most admires, then invo invite both student and prof for Thai food and talk. Or when asked, faith or science, philosophy or pop culture, baked or fries, Europe or the United States, here or hereafter, answer as your dad would, both. The second poem is about suffering. And its, uh, it's, its subject is a, a rock figure who sits on a bay, over, overlooking a bay on a, on a, like a hill above it, the Barra, on the Barra Peninsula in Ireland. And this hag is a real old, I mean, she looks like an elderly woman who has borne everything. And there is lore about her. And I wrote this poem to suggest who she is and all she has done and what, and what she is. So the only thing you won't understand is there's a mountain that she looks at called Mishkish behind the, across the bay and up the other side of the peninsula. She sits on her haunches, <clears throat> arms resting on her knees a shawl about her made of whatever you see, cloud, sheepskin, rough spun wool, draped seaweed. She watches the town, the bony hills, mishkish behind them, the bay, waves frothing to escape. Watches the moon rising or the sun. Salt-coated eyelashes sometimes alter what she sees. No wave breaking can move her, no hurricane. Winds that blow gulls onto the cliff she scarcely feels. But the suffering, so heavy. Only granite could bear it, she's become granite. To see the wounded wander the world, hiding their shame. She already knows, has seen them crossing deserts, oceans, and years hoping to rest their foreheads against her shoulder. No magic, not her deepest fiery touch, can stop the black crows pecking at their liver and their heart. You are without worth, too stupid to live, impossible that you should have dignity, should have a home, unforgivable the shame you bear. She cannot unsee what the broken show her, might ask why, might make them see more, but she offers her gift. I am like you, she says. What happened to you happened to me. What you've done, I've done. Touch the crags of my face to feel how I love you, earth love. Bedrock permanent love. After the pilgrims turn back, find the road to Castletown Bear and Ard Groom. Some wash themselves in the sea, fluff off her touch. Most carry her, though she won't leave the cliff, with them along the twisting, narrow roads. Uh, the next three poems are from my collection, one of my collections published by Signature. Um, and I must say, I think we owe a great debt to Signature Books. During the whole of my adult lifetime, Signature has 
greatly increased the scientific, well, the historical and intellectual life of Mormons. And especially, it is such a gift that they publish and continue to publish poetry. So I really appreciate them for that. Uh, my book with signature is called Salt, my second collection. And this, po this poem is about salt, the law of salt. And these poems are mostly about living in the desert. This one starts in Salzburg, Austria, where there are salt mines, and then it goes quickly to the Great Salt Lake. So this poem, I have to have a drink of water. Okay, <clears throat> the law of salt. From God's body, sweat flowed into the seas during the six days he worked on the world. This was the beginning of salt. Day, of course, meant eon. And so salt sang through oceans, seeped into rock, gathered itself in veins in the body of the earth. This formed the patience of salt. Small anonymous men burrowed below mountains seeking it, their first descent a tunnel through darkness and dripping water that bled into an underground lake. They brought down a boat to float themselves in one flickering torch across the surface, part savor, part fear. This led to the harvest of salt. More valuable than gold, it could preserve, not merely decorate flesh, strips of flesh cured in salt. In the retreat of a landlocked sea, the water fell into a saturated brine in which a body cannot sink. This gathered the powers of salt. A hard, slick pan left by that sea spreads for days into the west a burning skin of salt. The wild mare in her foal skittering across the flats will be found on their sides, tongues out, hide and muscles perfect, eye sockets crusted, purified by salt. And yet the sprinkled tomato, blood in our bodies, the taste of sex, all remnants of God. We eat death as we eat salt. Uh, this next poem is an elegy for um, a panel, a rock cliff art panel near Moab that was destroyed um, by someone. It's unknown who did it. This poem is called Desecration. The first two sections of the poem uh, are a, describe the panel and then the rest is about its destruction. The god of the hunt raises a stinging snake, releases another, and from the infinity in his chest throws four worlds into the air, two of feathers, two of fire. Trees sprout from his head where insects exalt themselves into circling birds and even the turtle flies. The other nameless god, half apparition, half ghost, these with spirit eyes, none can pass without an accounting. The seven beings below my hand, he asks, do you see humans or the backsides of deer? Do you live in the elk and the toad? Why should a brother bear give you his life? Someone scraped away the gods guarding this canyon with Ajax, water, a wire brush. Vandals scar, but don't obliterate. To scour the forms was not the usual desecration. Mindless gunshots or the carved narcissism of tourists who must engrave their present over the ancient past. No, this act appeared in the mind of someone who hated someone who loved the old art, or an hysterical priest of a weak god who required the extermination of history, lest his lack of power be exposed. Even as the destroyer scratched out their lines, 
The gods sorrowed for the stumbling bison of his strength, the eagle carcass that had been his heart, and withdrew where it's harder to find them into mountain bluebirds, night song, the fine red dust. And this poem is about how, how hard it is for people who try to live in the Utah desert to make a home. Uh, it came from observing that almost everyone has at least two jobs to make enough to make ends meet. So this poem is called Cobbled. Ringed by desert mountains, we live in a depression, deep and long, jackrabbit haven. Valley so remote, it feels like a road stop on the way out of the world. To keep from going, we cobble together our lives. A chicken coop out of tar paper and chain link. Build the kitchen a year before the porch. Batched, not botched, our structures skew, but they hold. Most of us batch a living as well. Walt Hatch, rancher, lays carpet. Nights, pig oats and guards the water line. Mornings, he hauls turkeys to the turkey plant. Today, the sign at the pin cushion became Nedra's sewing notions and damaged freight. That's fine. We're not sorry for ourselves. Self-pity rattles for a while, then turns on you and strikes. Wild animals tell us make do thrive. Badgers bite and hold on. Deer run straight at barbed wire. Magpies poke bark after stick into mud until strands catch and cross. Form a crazed dome strong enough to hold eggs that sway and lurch all the days they're becoming alive. Now I'm switching gears really like precipitously. This poem is a kind of a, a celebration of being young and stupid, and it's about me. Call je jeune, which means naive. My 17-year-old self longed to be so radiant, lambent, ephemeral, that anyone looking through me could see God, both through and at me. I would become a spiritual magnet. During freshman dances, a heavenly spotlight would fall over me, boogalooing in my kicky black polka dot dress, its skirt halfway up my thigh, though modest with white tights. And next day at church, someone tall and beetle banged would angle in, beg me to save him because he'd seen my light and all. We'd go to the game. I'd wear my neon yellow sweater with bell bottoms of the same bright buzz and inflame the stadium with my sunny, rare diamond worth. The runs, the passes, he'd find mere distractions from my wink and smile, my God loves you gaze. Next, the formal, me in a floor length, ruffled, barely pink and pearly dress, dancing close all night, such worship I'd inspire. I would be someone other than myself, a skinny, unsure innocent. I didn't know that yearning opens the soul to the body's scent. That heavenly rapture has an earthly bent. And this last poem is um, a celebration of, it, it's a complete metaphor about all that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had to go through to become who she is and to give the gifts she has given and it's called Why She Didn't. Because of the avalanche, because Visigoth Horde stole her sled dogs, because her snowshoes became fuel for their fires, because she had only a few live traps, because pulling takes hundreds of snowshoe rabbits, because training proved difficult, they didn't respond to mush because Visigoths called in the wolves a carnivorous lot, because blood and carnage littered the snow, then raptors, because time was a factor, because snow up to her knees made a long slog, 
because by nightfall she could still see her previous camp, because sunblind madness, nothing but diamonds of frost, because the map they gave her was of another province, because she had to navigate by the moon, because she circled villages for sustenance, pilfered their stores, because to break through the city gate, she levered a rock off a cliff. Because during the audience, her judges wore earmuffs. Because she lacked stamina, industry, ingenuity, they said, and because she didn't wear a suitable frock. Um, that's all. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate. Dana Patterson is the author of Titania in Yellow. Port Billy Press 2019, and If Mother Braids a Waterfall, Signature Books 2020. She is the founding editor-in-chief of Psaltery and Lyre and a co-editor of Dove Song, Heavenly Mother, and Mormon Poetry. I'd like to turn the time over to you, Dana. Thank you, Becky. <clears throat> Thank you, Becky. Um, I, this has been such a delight. I'm, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just having a great time. I hope that our audience is having a great time too. I, I've just been enjoying so much um, hearing Lisa and Marilyn and Susan read their beautiful poetry. And it's making me just even more grateful to be um, in the same uh, press family. And uh, I'm just delighted. Um, something I'm missing about these virtual readings is I, I went to um, a poetry reading this past winter. Um, Kave Akbar was reading in Seattle and he talked about poetry moves, right, where, where somebody's reading a poem and, and you're enjoying it and you do a, mm, you know, of pleasure. And I'm, I'm missing that as I'm mooing over here at <laughs> Lisa and Marilyn and, and Susan, that they're not able to hear how much I. I'm enjoying and appreciating and, and laughing out loud at Jejun. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad you read that poem, Susan. It's fantastic. Um, this poem, my first poem, Wish Bank, is, is a poem that um, I, uh, one of my daughters mentioned that she, she kept a wish bank. Like she, if she saw a star, you know, a star up at night and, and got a wish from that, if she didn't want to use it right away, she just put it in her wish bank. And I think I've mentioned something on social media about that. And Susan Elizabeth Howe responded and she's like, that's a wonderful idea for a poem. Do you mind if I borrow that? And I was like, go ahead. And then later I got to thinking, well, maybe I, maybe I should write a poem too. And I, um, I worried that Susan would be uh, offended that I had given the idea to her and then taken it back, but I shouldn't have been worried because Susan is super generous and big hearted and um, and wonderful. So this is a poem I'm reading for Susan Wishbank. Repository of first stars spied, fizzing like pop rocks in night's purple mouth. Cache of candles blown out in a single breath, of air sprinting in the lungs until a tunnel's glowing edge lopes to a slow gold finish. Treasury of eyelashes wisped from cheeks landing and puffed into space, swirling with the dust. Each wish a new coin tucked behind a loose brick. Each wish a feather found snagged in grass, brassy blue, kept in case wings are wanted, in case one feather isn't enough to fledge arms of flesh or call back mother from her country of bone. Store up each seed head blown, each month begun with rabbit rabbiting across the tongue. Seal them in cells, deposit them in dream. Log them in the heart's ledger and keep heedful register on the mind's balance sheet. A tally mark for every single falling star, every nickel flicked into fountain's burble, 
the weight of wishes like a fish's bright mail. The next few pieces I'm going to share are from my new book, Out From Signature Books, just, just as the pandemic hit the United States. Um, it was released at the end of February, I think about the same time that coronavirus made landfall about an hour south of where I live in Everett, Washington. Um, this piece for me and the pieces that I'm gonna share from my book, I feel like resonate really well with the theme of grief and gratitude. Um, like Marilyn said, you know, often there's that tension of both within the poems. Um, and I, I, I tried to capture that, both the enormous gratitude that I have from being raised in the Mormon community and also some of the grief at leaving. Um, so this, this first piece is the first piece in the book, The Mormons Are Coming. And I, I'm not sure if it's a poem or a lyric essay, um, you can decide. I kind of love that it straddles the border, maybe. Um, this is The Mormons Are Coming. Mormons bring a handmade wreath of white mesh, silver ribbon, tinsel sprigs, a cheese and potato casserole, an offering of white lilies. Mormons bring a package of diapers, a green onesie, a purple turtle quilt. They bring a musical mobile that dangles Eeyore, Piglet, Tigger, and Pooh. They surprise you with a two-foot Christmas tree, white lights, red balls, and a golden star. They bring cranberry orange walnut bread, gingerbread, cinnamon rolls. They say, I'm sorry for your loss. They say, congratulations. They say, Merry Christmas. The Mormons are coming. They drink eggnog without rum. They drink Ovaltine and Postum. They drink Mountain Dew and Diet Coke in 32 ounce mugs. Energy drinks, yes. Coffee and tea, no. Alcohol, never. Mormons rake your leaves, weed your weeds, babysit your kid while you go to the hospital to have another kid. Mormons build monuments of prairie families and covered wagons and hand carts. They hold the weight of family trees and martyrdom and pioneer blood in their cupped palms. They say, my ancestors knew Joseph Smith, donated their china for crushing to make the temple's stucco sparkle, buried their massacred dead at Hans Mill. My husband says, my ancestor was Brigham Young's shoemaker, and there were a lot of little feet to shod. I say, my ancestor went to prison for polygamy. Three wives, 19 sons, nine daughters, 107 grandchildren. Mormons bless their new babies in white, baptize their children in white coveralls and pinafores, white at their weddings, white in their temples, white when they're laid out in their coffins, an apron of green around their waists. They wear white undergarments, woven with folkloric magic, bullets repelled, burns deflected. Mormons dot hills with electric spires, Nauvoo Temple, Salt Lake Temple, a temple in your neighborhood, brazenly bright. The Mormons are coming. They come in the middle of the night when you have a blinding migraine. They come with consecrated olive oil and warm hands and baritone prayers. They come in the morning and sweep up the crying baby. They come in the afternoon and feed your cats, your turtles, your birds. Mormons bring a space blanket, a flashlight with extra batteries, a portable radio, a case of granola bars, a bucket of wheat, a crate of water. The Mormons are coming by car, by bicycle, on foot. They knock on your door. They wear black name tags and glowing faces and shiny hope. I wore a name tag, Sir Kid, 
Église de Jésus-Christ des Saints des Derniers Jours. French in my mouth, a mangled nasturtium. They say, welcome to the neighborhood. They say, it's nice to meet you. They say, see you Sunday. Mormon men wear white shirts, dark suits, and power ties. They are clean cut, well shaven. Mormon women wear dresses or skirts in peach, spring green, lilac. A few rebels wear slacks. Mormons say, follow the prophet. They say, fathers preside. They say, men have priesthood, women have motherhood. Mormons gather for Sabbath in low church chapels. They shush their gigawatt kids and pass silver plates of torn wonder bread, trays of water in thimble sized paper cups. My daughters ask, why do only boys pass the sacrament? Mormons build a grand conference center with a waterfall welcome mat, a garden roof of native grasses and trees. They build it big enough to park two planes inside, to gather masses, Mormon masses from around the world. They arrange a room of plinths with the bronze busts of their prophets. My daughters ask, why are all the statues of men? Mormons issue proclamations, a proclamation to wash away polygamy, a proclamation to define the family, marriage between man and woman only. They say families are forever and paint the words in cursive above their doors like a threshold blessing, a paschal lamb's blood. The Mormons are coming. Mormons put up Prop 8 signs, they make calls, they go door to door, they have practiced going door to door. They say hate the sin, but not the sinner. They say it's a choice. They say gay is okay, just stay celibate. And when a daughter, son, aunt, uncle, cousin, best friend, or comes out, my mother tells me I'm bisexual. I agonized for half a decade's doubt before deciding to leave. Mormons send priesthood holders. Mormons send sister teachers. Mormons send missionaries. And when I ask them to stop, they send a card every month, a card with no return address. The cards say, it's spring now, summer's here, autumn's coming. This is another piece from my book, If Mother Braids Waterfall, and this is for my mother, dear mom. December lady, the day you came out to me, I was in my hibernacle, so comfortable in the warm smell of my own pelt and the cave's dry envelope where I slept in a ball, dreaming of silver fish and spring. You startled me awake with your crunching feet, bearing news through a fresh fall. I had smelled winter from my hideaway, but you took me by the paw. Accustomed to dark, my eyes sought blindly. Snow sheathed the pine needles. You showed me what I'd slept through at every hint of frost. Snow sculpted into waves. No doubt, you feared the probability of my bite, my claws. Snow fell soft, each flake filigreed, scintillant. You're human after all, and one swipe could have finished you. I took off my thick coat, felt colds blow, what you'd borne these hush mouth years. I yanked teeth from my jaws, how sharp. Tore razors from my fingers, how many cuts. Left den behind, shoulder to shoulder in my ample fur. You teach me to forage for winterberry and root 
no need to devour your heart. The last poem I'm gonna share uh, today is the title poem to the collection. And funny story, Marilyn actually helped me choose um, what the title for the book should be. Um, some feedback that I got from Signature Books, and I, I think from Lisa, was that the original title just wasn't gonna cut it. Um, the original title for the book was uh, Letters to My Polygamous Ancestors. And she was like, try again. So I pulled everybody that I knew, um, and it was Marilyn who said, well, when I read your manuscript, the title of that poem stuck, stuck out to me. And I was like, thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> so thank you, Marilyn. Um, the book is titled If Mother Braids a Wa Waterfall because, because of Marilyn. If Mother Braids a Waterfall in a country where no one speaks her language, if she's a shrine, few bow to, few supplicate. If she's a book no one reads, verses rich as incantation. If mother weaves a forest floor from tree roots in a swath of clear cut. If she untangles rivers into tributary threads, the beds long since dry. If she's a gold rush with no prospectors, a queen bee with no drones, honeycomb without attendants. If in the morning, mother conducts a chorus of larks, if at night, a throng of nightingales, if her children sleep through the song, if she holds a rope through an oubliette's trapdoor, calls down to us, but we focus on the guard, pushing grub through the bean slot once a day his thrilling fingertips, his footstep echoing as he walks away. If we look up at last, if we relearn mother tongue through hard listening, if she's the one and only, not one of many, a clairvoie of Egyptian glass in the stucco's arabesque, a gold seam for our brokenness, our shards, an arroyo parched for the rain of our praise. If she's starscape, all dark and blaze and hungry for our eyes. So that's my final poem. And I wanted to show you something I made out of that poem, which I'm calling a poem broidery, a poem plus embroidery, poem broidery. Um, is something that I've been working on lately is uh, adding some, some stitchery to pieces I've written. Um, uh, yeah, and, and this is this picture, uh, this piece is posted on my website if, if folks would like to take a look at it. Anyway, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Well, I just would like to thank all of you women. This has been truly delightful. And uh, just thank you all so much um, for this. It, I've really enjoyed this so much. Uh, we're gonna open for questions for um, the remainder of the time. And so if any of you that are watching would like to ask a question of uh, one of these women, please just put it in the Huba app and, um, and I'll go ahead and read it. I do have a couple of uh, questions I also have I just wanted to give you a couple of um, shout outs. We had some, one, one person said, wow. Um, and I know that was for all of you. Someone else said, for the intelligence of the body, even in decay, gorgeous. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, someone else uh, is asking, Lisa, with your poem, Oh, Take and Seal It, what prompted you to artfully space the words the way you did? How does that spacing inform the poem's meaning for you? Well, look at that. That's a poetics question. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I had an experience of sitting in church in the back row. Um, my, my youngest son and I were um, <laughs> giving it a shot and uh, and the singing has always been one of the best parts for me. And um, that song was 
one of the one of the hymns, I believe. And so, and there was something about it that really, really like just um, touched me. And partly it's that uh, that part prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the the land I love. And it that was what um, pierced me. At, went upon hearing it and, and singing it with my son and with my neighbors. And I think I thought the there was something that I wanted to do that was with the with the way the poem looked and the way it felt on the page that had to do with wandering and that had to do with uh, a path because I, I tried to uh, as I was shaping the poem I tried to have the you know lines be broken but also go together in a way. So there's a path, but it's like a broken path. And, and an example of something that I can think of is um, if you've ever gone to a, an ancient road um, where you can, see the, you can see the path and its continuity, but you can also, when you're actually walking it, there's something um, th that it's fallen apart. You can make your way, but it's not, it's not seamless anymore. And I think that was sort of what I was trying to get at. And it that's only, I mean, it's only about my own, you know, experience on that path. So that's what I think I was, <laughs> this that's is what I'm wonderful. saying about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, someone else asked, um, well, actually made a, made a statement that they would, they would hope that we would have time to hear at least a little bit about each of your approaches to writing. How, when, how often do you write poems? Maybe you could just go in order of how you read your poems and just give us a, a little two minute overview of, of how, when, how often, maybe what inspires you. <laughs> well, I'll start. Um, I, uh, I remember reading um, Stanley Kunitz late in his life talking about how poems came to him less frequently. And I remember also um, that Philip Levine talked about talking to his teacher, John Berryman, who gave him advice when he was leaving um, the program where he had been his teacher. And he's so, so Berryman said to Levine, when you are young, write everything that occurs to you. And I will say this, that I do go through moments, uh, you know, seasons in my life where things come faster and I try really, really hard to pay attention to that. One more anecdote from other poets. Uh, Ruth Stone talked about how when she was working out Side and outside of her house that she could feel the poem coming from a long way off and she had to make sure she got in position so that she could catch it when it came through her and sometimes she missed them sometimes she didn't get to the right place to catch them so I don't necessarily feel that way but I do try to be ready I do try to be ready wonderful Marilyn do you have something to share uh, sure um, I actually get seeds of my poems a lot. I get a lot of seeds. And, but it's really a, a process for me to be able to then turn that into a poem. It's really hard, it's mentally exhausting. And I think the older I get, the more it gets that way. And I am not as disciplined as I should be um, because I lose a lot of them. I have post-it notes all over the place with um, ideas. And I think they would work if I just, if I just make myself sit down because I never feel good until it's out of me. And so, um, but I do, um, and I do get a lot of inspiration from just reading from other poets, even though they don't write like I do or anything, but I, it's hard to read a poem. You probably all feel like this without thinking of a poem yourself that kind of, you know, is spurred from that. And so, I just see them everywhere. It's just being able to get them down. They don't come easily for me. Thank you. Susan, did you have something? Um, things that are just astonishing or gripping to me, but that I don't understand are the place where poems that generally manage to stay alive come from. If it's something I already know my way through, 
then it's just a dead poem. And I, I have to say, I write a lot of poems that never make it. And only maybe 30% of my poems live. <laughs> or, uh, and even sometimes, I have to say, Dana, I didn't read my Wish Bank poem because I went back to it and it was terrible. <laughs> I don't, then I thought, I can't read this. This is awful. <laughs> I recognize its flaws now. I have to work on it some more. So I'm glad it worked for you. Um, but I have to feel some intrigue with a subject, whether it's from my own life or from something I see, and then, uh, and then work through it. I have a writing group and that helps me really a lot, though we've been on hiatus since COVID. And um, so I have to take a poem every week to that writing group. And that really helps keep you on task and keep me going. So that's another thing that's very helpful to me. Thank you. And sometimes we are the hardest critics on ourselves, <laughs> I, I believe. Dana? Um, Susan stole what I was going to say. I was going to say writing groups. <laughs> um, I, I get up and write every morning. Um, I have a nine to five desk job. So if I don't make time in my day to do it, then it doesn't happen. So I get up at six and I write for a couple hours. Um, but a lot of that, my brain is not fully awake at that time. And so a lot of the work that I do early in the morning is revising or revis revisiting uh, a poem that needs um, polishing. Um, but I do, I try to keep a notebook with me at all times so I can jot down the ideas as they come. Cause like Ruth Stone, I feel it come in or I get that idea and it's something mysterious that I maybe don't understand all the way, um, a, a mystery or a surprise that I want to lean into. So I try to have I something to that I can, I can jot down those jot notes. Down. Great. Well, I, I certainly have been enlightened today. I, um, I have really enjoyed moderating this session and, and getting to know a little bit more about each of you. It's been delightful for me. Um, our time is just about up. I really would like to thank all of the attendees. Thank you for being here and for supporting Sunstone. I really would especially like to thank our presenters today, Lisa, Marilyn, Susan, and Dana. And I hope you, that you all enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your weekend. Thank you, Becky. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thanks for the opportunity. It was really wonderful to participate.